Well, hello and welcome everyone to this tutorial on complement biology and its association with disease. My name is Simon Clark. I'm the current Helmut Ecker Endowed Professor of AMD at the University of Tübingen. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Stephen J. Ryan Initiative for Macular Research for the opportunity to give this talk today. As a way of overview, I'll start by setting the scene around the discovery of complement. And then we'll look at the complement system overall, how it is activated and the molecular consequences of that activation. We'll explore how complement turnover is regulated for it is here that the greatest association with disease is often found. And by way of example, we'll, go, we'll discuss a couple of diseases associated with complement overactivation um, in the blood, in the kidney, and of course, due to the nature of this tutorial, we will end up focusing on the role of complement in age-related macular degeneration. So complement was discovered over 100 years ago by Dr. Hans Buchner, a German medic, who discovered that there was a heat-liable component of blood that helped kill bacteria. And not knowing what it was, he named it alexin, which is derived from the Greek word to fend off. And another German scientist, Professor Paul Ehrlich, um, he coined the phrase complement a few years later because this alexin quite literally complemented the role of immune cells and the adaptive immune response in his blood immunity experiments. He was a prolific immunologist and he was the chap that coined the phrase chemotherapy and the concept of the magic bullet and was ultimately awarded the Nobel Prize for his work in blood immunology in 1908. The complement system, often referred to as the complement cascade for reasons I hope will become apparent in the next few slides, is a collective term for a series of enzymatic reactions that leads to immune cell recruitment from the circulation, inflammation, opsonization, which is the labeling of surfaces for destruction by phagocytosis, cell lysis and tissue remodeling. Now, a complement uh, response it usually involves about 40, 45 different proteins and is a very powerful part of the host's innate immune system, primarily responsible for protecting a host against bacterial infections. And there's numerous diseases associated with the malfunctioning complement system, perhaps unsurprisingly bacterial infections and sepsis. sepsis and the systemic blood diseases, as well as diseases that target specific organs, such as the brain, the kidney, and the eye. It's worth noting here that, in fact, complement activation rarely be, um, is the cause of a disease, but more often than not, is associated with making the disease significantly worse, although there are a couple of exceptions to that rule. Complement has a reputation for being somewhat complicated, but in fact is actually very simple, especially once you've broken it down into its constitutive components, which we will do here. You have complement activation, followed by the amplification of complement. This is this exponential amplification loop and why people sometimes refer to it as the complement cascade rather than a, a linear pathway. You have the terminal pathway, and this is where we end up with cell lysis and cell death. And you have the opsonization pathway that you must traverse on your way through to complement inactivation. And so we will deal with each of these in turn. So we begin with the activation of complement. Complement can be activated through one of three individual pathways, the classical, the lectin, or the alternative pathways. Now, the classical pathway, perhaps unsurprisingly, this is the one that the German scientists um, were had discovered in their, their blood experiments with bacteria. There's an effector protein called C1Q. Now, C1Q recognizes antibodies that have been deposited on the surface of bacteria. And as it binds those antibodies, it causes a conformational change within the, the protein complex that activates an associated serine protease. This is in turn able to cleave other blood components, C2 and C4, and the proteolytic fragments of these come together and form a C3 
Convertes, which associates with the surface not far from that C1Q and IgG um, interaction. Exactly the same thing happens in the lectin pathway, but here the effector molecule is not C1Q. It's something called mannose binding lectin or MBL, and it doesn't need the presence of IgG in order for it to become activated. It literally recognizes directly patterns of sugar molecules on the surface of bacteria. But the downstream consequences are exactly the same. And in fact, it forms exactly the same C3 convertase associated to the bacterial cell wall. The alternative pathway, as the name suggests, runs quite differently. Here, there is no effector molecule per se, and it relies on the natural um, hydrolysis of a major blood protein called C3. Now, the hydrolysis of C3 allows it to associate with a surface, but it associates with any surface it comes into contact with. So unlike the other effective molecules, C1Q and MBL, here it's not directed against a pathogenic target. It's quite literally on any surface it comes into contact with. Hydrolyzed C3, uh, once attached to a surface, um, allows the binding of complement factor B to form this complex, which is processed again by complement factor D to form an alternative pathway C3 Convertase, differing in protein composition, but whose function is exactly the same as the C3 convertase is formed in the classical lectin pathway. Here, this convertase is stabilized by the presence of properdin, or uh, more commonly now known as complement factor P. But despite which activation pathway complement has uh, begun, they all focus on the proteolytic cleavage of more C3 into C3B. So we're no longer relying now on the natural tick over or the general hydrolysis of C3. This is targeted active proteolysis of C3. And as C3 is processed, it exposes an internal thioester within C3B that allows it to covalently bond to any surface it comes into contact with. Again, Whilst on the surface, it is bound by complement factor B, that's processed by complement factor D, stabilized by properdin, and forms another C3 convertase. And this is the beginning of the amplification loop, where you have this exponential deposition of C3B and creation of more C3 convertases. As this amplification loop is spinning uh, round, it's releasing proteolytic fragment of C3 called C3A, and C3A is an anaphylatoxin, so it's a chemiattractant, it's recruiting circulating immune cells and activating them to do a whole range of things, including the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. We will talk a little bit about the anaphylatoxins later on. As the concentration of C3B molecules increases on a surface, eventually it starts to associate um, uh, with already established C3 convertases. So you end up with two C3B molecules um, for every convertase. And at this point, the specificity of the convertase changes slightly and it can now cleave another protein called complement C5. So these C5 convertases uh, cleave C5 into C5B and C5A. C5A is the second anaphylatoxin, which goes off and does exactly the same as C3A. And C5B is the start of the formation of this membrane attack complex, or this MAC, which forms pores embedded within the phospholipid bilayers of cells and creates cell lysis. In fact, MAC has uh, been a, somewhat of a focal point in the complement uh, world because it is by its own nature the end point of a complement overactivation. So it's often been used as a biomarker for complement activation and what people look for in various different disease models to show that complement has had some sort of activity prior to, to that event. And so we know quite a lot about its structure um, and the way the pore is formed. I'm showing some wonderful examples of, of recent uh, structural biology studies from the uh, Paul Morgan group in the University of 
Cardiff. And you can see these exquisite structures and images of these cryo-EM uh, images of these um, membrane attack complex pore. And it has also been the subject of a lot of interest when it comes to therapeutic intervention, because the idea is if one can prevent either the attachment of C5B or any of the other components or the proliferation of C9 into the actual pore, you can prevent the lysis of cells and thus somehow ameliorate the, um, uh, the, the deleterious effects of complement activation on cell surfaces. We then have the opsonization pathway. Like I said, this is the pathway one has to go through in order to eventually get to the deactivation of complement. So as the amplification loop is uh, spinning out of control, it is possible to regain control and eventually switch it off. And this is achieved by an enzyme called complement factor I. Now factor I is able to cleave C3B and inactivate it, forming IC3B. Now, the thing about IC3B is it cannot contribute to the amplification loop of complement. So as more IC3B is generated and there's um, not so much C3B uh, available um, for the amplification loop, that amplification loop slows down and eventually is starved completely and, and stops. And this stops the release of anaphylatoxins and the formation of the membrane attack complex. But there is a problem. IC3B remains a potent opsonin. That is to say that all those immune cells that are now hanging around the site of complement activation are still recognize it as a danger signal and it induces phagocytosis. This is switched off again by complement factor I cleaving IC3B into even smaller degradation products. The first one C3DG and eventually C3D. Now Factor I can only do all of this in the presence of a cofactor, and we'll talk about the cofactors in, in depth in a couple more slides, but su suffice to say that there are lots of cofactors that allow factor I to cleave C3B into IC3B and thus stop a complement amplification, but there is only one cofactor that allows factor I to switch off the opsonization and fully switch off a complement response. This is all to do with levels of affinity. So every time that C3B is cleaved, the affinity for specific uh, receptors on immune cells and phagocytes um, changes. And eventually, as you slowly, slowly get to smaller and smaller uh, cleavage product of C3, the affinity drops off. And ultimately, by the time you reach the end, there's very little affinity left and the immune cells become disinterested, disengage and wander back off again. So these anaphylatoxins, C3A and C5A, these are recruiting um, circulating immune cells to the sites of complement overactivation. An example, you can see the video here of neutrophil chemotaxis to a zymogen. This is work done by the Heinrich lab, UC Davis. In this particular experiment, uh, the, the major signal is actually C5A. Not only do they recruit immune cells, but when they engage their receptors on these cells, they cause a whole range of different reactions, the production of inflammatory cytokine secretion, but they also cause in other cell types, smooth muscle contraction, vasodilation, degranulation of mast cells, and enhanced vascular permeability. Now, clearly with such a powerful acute phase immune response, it is incredibly important for it to be tightly regulated. And virtually every cell in your body carries a whole array of different um, complement inhibitors to prevent inappropriate activation of the complement system. For example, you have membrane bound complement inhibitors, such as the membrane cofactor protein, MCP, also known as CD46. And that acts as a factor I cofactor that targets C3B or C4B deposition and allows factor I to, to cleave it. You've also got decay accelerating factor or DAF um, that it doesn't help factor I cleave these products, but what it does is it physically helps dissociate these C3 and C5 convertases from a surface. 
you've got complement receptor 1 or CR1. We already introduced this, this molecule. It inhab inhibits all three of the activation pathways. It's most potent factor I cofactor in the human body and the only one that deals not only with the inflammation and um, MAC formation, but also the opsonization part of complement activation. And you have CD59, which is a, a molecule on the surface of cells, which embeds itself into um, C9 and prevents the proliferation of that uh, pore of MAC, so a built-in anti-MAC inhibitor. It's very similar to other proteins like vitronectin and clustera. Now, these aren't official complement regulators. They do lots of other things, um, but they also prevent the formation of MAC complex on a cell surface. Now, the majority of these complement inhibitors are characterized, with the exception of CD59, the majority of them are characterized by being made up of specific domains called CCP domains or complement control protein domains. There are also fluid phase regulators of the complement uh, system. Well, there's only a couple of them. Uh, the C4B, so the C4 binding protein or C4BP, which as the name suggests, binds to C4B and acts as a cofactor for factor I. It helps regulate the classical and lectin pathways. But there's also a protein called complement factor H, and that binds to C3B and acts as a cofactor for factor I. Now, the important thing about factor H is factor H contains anchoring domains. So these are CCP domains that are able to bind to cell surfaces, but also acellular structures, such as basement membranes. And for this reason, factor H is one of the only factor I cofactors in the human body that protects your acellular structures, such as the extracellular matrix and basement membranes. There are many diseases associated with changes in factor H function on levels, and they usually affect uh, complement amplification on extracellular matrix. Now, the anchoring domains in factor H are in CCP7 and CCP1920, and they're mainly um, recognized sulfated glycosaminoglycans, these long unbra unbranched sulfated sugars that are present on proteoglycans, um, like such as heparan sulfate and dermatan sulfate. The CCPs 1920 are responsible also for the binding via sialic acids uh, to surfaces and uh, cell membranes. And there are coding variants and genetic variants associated with AMD that cluster in these particular regions, uh, particularly around CCP7. Why is this important? Well, it's the recognition of heparan sulfate by factor H that allows uh, factor H to protect basement membranes such as Brooks membrane and the glomeruli basement membrane uh, within human kidneys. Now, the interesting thing about these two particular membranes is that unlike any other basement membrane in the human body, these two are in direct contact with the blood. Traditionally, the basement membrane would be on the other side of the uh, cell monolayer, the um, epithelial cell monolayer, but in these cases, they're actually on the side of the blood, making them incredibly susceptible to C3 deposition or C3 hydrolyzed C3 deposition. So the binding of factor H to these basement membranes is imperative to prevent complement overactivation. The interesting thing is the two anchoring domains in factor H seem to confer different specificities for different heparan sulfate uh, sulfation sequences within these tissues. So, for example, um, the anchoring domain in CCP7 seems to predominantly um, anchor factor H to the basement membrane, the Brooks membrane in the eye, whereas the 1920 region doesn't have much in the way of an influence uh, in factor H anchoring. And yet in the kidney, it's almost the other way around. And in fact, genetic variants within the 1920 region are predominantly uh, affecting kidney disease, 
whereas mutations and genetic variants within the CCP6-8 to region predominantly affect diseases of the outer blood retinal barrier. So factor H does not exist in isolation. There are a number of proteins of, of very similar homology to, to factor H. The gene that makes uh, or transcribes the factor H protein resides in chromosome 1 in a region called the RCA cluster, or the region of complement activation cluster. And the gene makes two proteins. It not only makes the large 155 kilodalton highly glycosylated full length factor H, it also makes a truncated version called factor H like protein 1. FHL1 is um, identical to factor H for the first seven CCP domains before terminating in a unique C terminal tail. It is unglycosylated, but it does retain all of the binding functions of factor H and complement inhibitory uh, ability. Just downstream of the factor H gene are five factor H related genes, each making a protein product. And these proteins have a high degree of sequence homology, not only with the factor H protein itself, but also amongst each other. They can also bind many of the ligands of factor H, uh, C3B, glycosaminoglycan, sialic acid, but they cannot bind complement factor I. So this means that despite the fact that they combined all these different bits and pieces, they cannot inhibit complement activation. Now, complement factor H predominates in blood and tissues, and FHL1 very much is the minor component, but there are a couple of exceptions. More notably, um, certain tumor cells like glioblastoma, the brain cancer, overexpress FHL1. Um, but also, if you look in the Brooks membrane and the outer blood retinal barrier and the human eye, you will find that in fact FHL1 predominates within that structure. The current hypothesis for this is because due to its much smaller size and complete lack of glycosylation, it is able to diffuse much easier through tightly packed ECM, uh, protecting that ECM from C3 hydrolysis or C3B deposition. It should also be noted that genetic variants that affect the binding of factor H through CCP7 to GAGs and what have you doesn't make much of a difference to the full length protein or not much of a discernible difference in the laboratory because of the presence of the other anchoring domain which helps counteract that problem. But in the case of FHL1, Domain 7 is the only anchoring domain that the protein has. So any genetic variant in CCP7 disproportionately affects FHL1 function over full length factor H. So that's an overview of complement activation uh, and its regulation. So perhaps now would be a good time to look at some diseases associated with uh, complement dysregulation. The first one is uh, worth mentioning is paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, or PNH. It was a blood disorder characterized by complement-mediated hemolytic uh, anemia. And it's due to a somatic mutation in the X-linked phosphatidylinositol glycan class A gene. Essentially, we see a significant reduction in the amount of GPI-anchored proteins on the surface of red blood cells. And this, of course, includes the array of cell surface bound complement inhibitors. You get um, hemolysis of red blood cells um, due to excessive complement activation and the formation of the membrane attack complex. This is actually a really interesting example that um, demonstrates that, for example, factor H isn't a fantastically good regulator of activation of complement on cell surfaces because these red blood cells lies um, because of complement overactivation even though these patients have normal levels of circulating factor H. Now the median survival for patients with PNAH pre-2007 was about 10-15 years post-diagnosis and thrombosis was the leading cause of death in these patients.
In 2007, uh, a drug eculizumab was FDA approved for treating PNH. And eculizumab is an antibody based therapy targeting C5, which prevents the downstream MAC formation and cell lysis. It was a bit of a game changer and had real uh, good efficacy in patients suffering from, from PNH. But there are certain problems. For example, targeting C5 is downstream of the amplification loop. So you still get C3B deposition and the opsonization of these. It leads to extravascular hemolysis by phagocytes of the red blood cells. You can also get a pharmacokinetic breakthrough hemolysis. Essentially, um, there's a dip in the bioavailability of drug. And so the C5B that's present catalyzes the reaction. And by the time you get more eculizumab in there, lysis has already happened through MAC formation. But you also get pharma, pharmacodynamic breakthrough hemolysis, whereby they're simply overwhelmed with the presence of C3B that sort of skips the C5 um, uh, formation and still leads to, to, to MAC formation. So it's not perfect, but the need is such that multiple other uh, drugs targeting complement have now been FDA approved. You've got va uh, ravimizumab, um, it's approved in 2019, Pegsetacoplan uh, in 2021, and those working in the AMD field will recognize Pegsetacoplan as the um, pegylated comstatin molecule uh, marketed as Cyforbidae. Um And um, um, Iptacopan in 2023, which is a bit of a game changer because unlike the rest, Iptacopan is an orally administered complement inhibitor targeting complement factor B, and the hope is that it will deal with all these pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic breakthrough issues associated with the other the other drugs. Another example of complement uh, associated disease is dense deposit disease, once referred to as membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis type two or MPGN two. It's often now uh, debated whether or not it is a, it is a true um, MPGN and hence why the name's been changed. But it's a rare kidney disease that occurs predominantly in children between the ages of 5 and 15 years old and it is characterized by these dense deposits on the glomeruli basement membrane that are packed full or stain positive and packed full for C3. Now it can result from genetic variants in C3 and or factor H that uh, prevents function and that's either gain of function mutations in C3 which makes it less pervious to inhibition or a lack of function in factor H driven by poor anchoring to, to basement membranes or poor binding to C3. There are also a subpopulation of patients that have autoantibodies against complement factor H obviously pulling it out of that um, inhibitory role and the C3 convertase, which actually stabilizes the convertase and makes it even harder for factor H2 to, to dissociate that and um, to, to cleave it in the presence of factor I. Really interestingly, children suffering, a few children suffering from dense deposit disease often present with ocular drusen as well. So there's a very clear link between um, overactivation on the extracellular matrix or basement membranes of the um, kidneys glomeruli and the outer blood retinal barrier in the eye. This brings me rather neatly to our main focus or disease focus for this particular tutorial, age-related macular degeneration. Now AMD is uh, a progressive retinal disorder leading to the destruction of the macula. So that's the central part of the retina right at the very back of the eye. And it's a major cause of vision loss in patients over the age of 55. And in fact, accounts for up to 9% of global, global legal blindness. And there's actually been a very, very nice recent review on AMD by Monica Fleckenstein, uh, published in fact in January 2024. The early stage of disease is characterized by the presence of these drusen, these yellow um, defined lesions in the macular region of the eye. And at this stage, the patient may not have any real changes in visual acuity, but this can progress onto the late stage 
uh, of the disease. There's two different types of late stage. You have the uh, neovascular or wet AMD characterized by the um, presence of choroidal neovascularization, so it's the excessive blood vessel growth in the back of the eye that um, bleeds into the retinal tissue and causing, causing damage. And then you have the other late stage, which is known as dry AMD, characterized by the presence of geographic atrophy, defined islands of cell death in the RPE cells. Now, we've been able to treat the wet form of AMD for a number of years uh, with these anti-VEGF agents, which have been uh, very, very well received, incredibly efficacious in the lab and very easy to administer. But until recently, there's been absolutely no uh, effective treatments for the dry form of the disease, although that has changed um, in the last 18 or so months. The progression of geographic atrophy, as you can see on the right hand side, um, is is slow and it's when it ingresses into the fovea region, which is a central part of the retina, that you actually start to get real loss of central visual acuity and if left long enough will uh, completely consume that central part of a patient's vision. Now there's been an association of complement and AMD for a number of years. And in fact, I don't think I've done any justice at all to the number of studies that have linked biochemically, at least, um, complements in the eye of donor um, uh, patients' samples uh, that had suffered from, from AMD. You can see a myriad of papers at the bottom of the slide there, uh, but it's safe to say that for many, many years, since the late 1990s and Greg Hagerman and um, Don Anderson, I think, were some of the first to point out that these drusen uh, were packed full of a whole range of proteins, including C5, C3, and the membrane attack complex. But beyond um, the presence of complement proteins, it was in 2005 that there was a bit of a breakthrough, and it was noticed that there was genetic variants strongly associated with AMD risk, and that these genetic variants resided in the complement factor H gene. Now, 10 years after that, significantly more work um, had developed and investigated the genetic risk of disease. And these large GWAS studies, these genome-wide association studies, highlighted a whole range of genetic variants that modified a patient's risk for developing the disease. And this is um, a summary Manhattan plot from Fritsch et al., a very famous paper, Nature Genetics 2016, and it just shows all of the genetic variants and different chromosome or risk loci that reach significance or GWAS significance. But if you pay attention to this squiggly line on this particular axis, you will notice that this is not linear. And the reason for that is if it was, there would be two particular risk loci that dwarfed the rest of the signal. Um, one in chromosome one, and one in chromosome 10. And for the purposes of today's talk, I'm going to focus on the one in chromosome 1 because that resides in and around the gene for complement factor H. This is another way of representing the genetic data. Instead of, unlike the Manhattan plot, instead of listing genetic variants as strength of association of disease, this is a population attributable fraction uh, table that lists them in relation to their effect on any given population. So the on the left you've got protective genetic variants, on the right you've got the risk protective variants, and the deviation off of the midline is how much those genetic variants affect a given population. So you may well have a very strongly associated uh, genetic variant with disease somewhere in the middle, but if it's very very rare it's not going to affect many, many people in any given population. And you can see at the, the two extreme ends, and both risk and protective, there are genetic variants that do have a big effect on a population. And in fact, these are also chromosome one risk genetic variants. So not only are they strongly associated with disease, they actually have a very impactful downstream effect on the population. Now, there's some uh, debates even now that 
um, despite there being two clearly independent risk loci, chromosome 1 and chromosome 10, there's a bit of a debate as to whether or not these remain separate diseases or if, in fact, these two risk loci somehow biochemically merge at some point during the disease uh, pathogenesis. And this remains um, a little bit uh, of an unknown, although there are clearly people trying to make that association. In fact, genetic risk around chromosome 1 makes a significant contribution quite specifically to geographic atrophy. If you take a sample uh, GA population of, of, of patients uh, and do their genotyping, you'll, you'll find that in fact quite a lot of them are homozygous for risk at chromosome 1, and certainly indeed the majority of them will at the very least be heterozygous. Uh, for risk at chromosome 1, and only a small percentage, around 13%, won't actually carry any genetic risk at that risk loci. So a very much an enrichment of chromosome 1 risk in geographic atrophy. Now, chromosome 1 patients uh, tend to be the slowest progressors to late-stage AMD, but chromosome 10 patients uh, are much faster progressors and much more likely to develop uh, choroidal neovascularization. So there's a very strong case in terms of genetics for the role of complement in driving uh, AMD or driving the risk of AMD. But also beyond those early day stainings of Drusen showing complement proteins being deposited in, in Drusen, there's lots of other biochemical data that also links complement overactivation uh, with the early stages of disease. And in the early stages, one can find comp excessive complement deposition in and around the extracellular matrix surrounding the chorea capillaris, this fenestrated blood vasculature just underneath Brooks' membrane, which forms part of the outer blood retinal barrier. In fact, you find most of the complement deposition occurs in this space, and very little of it occurs within the retina certainly the early stages of disease, but later on uh, during geographic atrophy, work from Gerard Lutty and his, and his colleagues showed that you do get complement deposition, particularly in the edges of geographic atrophy uh, lesions. But interestingly, you can see complement deposition and activation in and around the corocapillaris in donor sample, um, sorry, donor eye samples from patients who carry genetic risk for AMD but have not yet developed the disease, strongly implying that complement overactivation is an early um, part of the disease process. And you see that complement overactivation in the corocapillaris, and it's associated with loss of blood vasculature in that space. Another interesting note is that we also see um, recruitment of immune cells into this space, which coincides with complement turnover markers. We see mast cell degranulation occurs in here, and we already know that complement is a major um, signaling pathway for immune cell recruitment and mast cell degranulation. So there's plenty of uh, biochemical evidence to suggest that complement is turning over excessively in this space in these patients. In fact, the truth be told, if you pick any marker of complement turnover or deposition that you want and you go looking for it in AMD eyes, you will find it predominantly in the outer blood retinal barrier. There's not very much complement deposition within the retinal tissue itself. It's all on that outer blood retinal barrier. Why? Is it likely to be in this ECM? Well, we're not entirely sure, but again, remember all of those genetic associations with AMD, the functional consequences are not entirely worked out, but those that are worked out clearly pinpoint a dysregulation of complement turnover on extracellular matrix. And one of those ways is through this uh, polymorphism in factor H, where there's a perturbation in its ability to anchor to glycosaminoglycans, such as heparan sulfate. Why, then, 
do you not get problems in your eyes when you're a young child? AMD is an age-related disease. You have to be relatively old before you get it. Well, there is a, a natural turnover of glycans all over the body. And this changes with age. And a study by Tin and Keenan was done, which shows that in fact there's a dramatic drop off in the amount of heparin sulfate available within Brooks membrane. And it's hypothesized that as that heparin sulfate bioavailability goes down, those people carrying genetic risk in their chromosome one struggle more and more to regain control of complement activation on that surface and therefore fall over into complement overactivation and um, tissue remodeling and, and breakdown of the outer blood retinal barrier. The question of um, ECM remodeling is highlighted also in, in a fairly recent study by Selena McCarg and uh, Paul Bishop in Manchester and showed that if you take the Brooks membrane from donor eyes once again, uh, the carrying genetic risk uh, for AMD, but without signs of AMD, there's an enrichment of proteases that are specifically released by mast cells, and that these proteases are turning over the collagen fibrils within that extracellular matrix. And the theory is that this continued ECM remodeling is inducing not only complement activation, but making the associated RPE cells incredibly sick and more susceptible to a whole range of other insults that they are receiving on a daily basis. Now, if you cast your mind back to um, these factor H related proteins, there's been some recent developments in their association with disease as well. For many, many years, um, we haven't been able to uh, measure these proteins in biological samples due to their high degree of sequence homology with um, factor H. But now emerging technologies mean that we can, in fact, do that. And a series of independent studies have identified an association uh, with elevated levels of circulating FHR proteins and AMD. These studies used um, different detection methods, um, whether it be um, ELISA's or through mass spectrometry, different cohorts of patients. One cohort was serum, the other one was plasma, and they all came out with exactly the same result. And in fact, further Mendelian randomization experiments suggest elevated FHR protein levels to be causative for AMD. Um, so elevated circulating levels aside, uh, remembering that these proteins are made exclusively in the human liver, the interesting thing is these FHR proteins accumulate in and around the chorea capillaris underlying Brooks membrane. And there's a series of fluorescent images and staining images, which you can see here to that effect. I particularly like the ones from the Lorez Motta study on the right, because they clearly show the accumulation of these proteins in that extracellular matrix and a complete absence of FHR proteins within the neurosensory retinal tissue itself. So these circulating proteins um, that produced in the human liver um, are able to accumulate it specifically in this extracellular matrix. What they're binding to, what they're doing, we're not entirely sure, but there is some evidence to suggest that they are causing complement overactivation by binding C3B and outcompeting the binding of FHL1. This feeds into the debate, the long running debate, around the relative contribution of locally made complement versus systemically available complement, bearing in mind that the complement system is a blood-borne uh, phenomenon all over, all over the body. It is uh, undoubtedly um, a phenomenon of the outer blood retinal barrier. We can physically see that both um, pre-AMD and post-AMD, you see complement deposition and ECM remodeling. But it's also undisputable that you can measure complement activation markers 
in the circulation and the blood of AMD patients. There's a whole array of studies that have looked into this and seen uh, differing levels of complement, circulating complement. It is very likely that um, you can measure markers of complement activation systemically that originate from local tissues. I'm not aware of any of these studies that have taken the blood of um, these patients and shown there's a deficiency in the complement system or an overactivation of the complement system in the blood itself. So it's more likely to be a byproduct of a local complement activation. But clearly there is local production of complement proteins in all these tissues. It wasn't that long ago when I was doing my PhD, maybe 20 years ago, where we were told religiously that complement was a liver a born phenomenon. We know that just simply is not the case. Um, complement is made all over the body, perhaps with the exception of the FHR proteins, but the eye is no different. And this is a really nice uh, study uh, from a couple of years ago that uh, looked at gene transcription of complement uh, proteins in eyes and showed, in fact, that not only was there a difference between the macular and peripheral regions of uh, for complement activation for complement gene transcription but also between the neurosensory retina and choroidal tissues showing a clear um, delineation and clear uh, landscaping of that complement activation um, profile this is made even more um, pronounced by the fact that the brooks membrane itself acts as a natural barrier to complement proteins. So the outer blood retinal barrier comprises both the RPE cell monolayer and Brooks membrane. But even in the absence of the RPE cell monolayer, the Brooks membrane is a formidable barrier for complement proteins to get across. And it turns out very, very few of them can actually get across, FHL1 being one of them. In fact, it turns out that majority of the glycosylated um, complement proteins are retained on whichever side of Brooks membrane that they are synthesized. The outcome to this is that essentially Brooks membrane alone is sufficient to create two immunologically distinct um, local environments for complement turnover and activation within the eye. The role of complement in opsonization has also recently been uh, highlighted in a number of uh, neurodegenerative diseases, uh, particularly in and around the, the brain. And it shows that there's a big, big link between microgliophagocytosis and synaptic loss. Um, and in fact, that this is mediated through the C R3 receptor recognizing and binding um, C3B and IC3B uh, on these on these synapses. And in fact, you can get rid of this by uh, blocking or genetically uh, removing the CR3 receptor on the microglia. This also is probably playing a role in AMD2. A very recent uh, study by uh, da uh, Danny uh, Saban. Um, a really nice study has shown that in patients or in uh, tissues uh, undergoing AMD, where there's geographic atrophy lesions and these sub retinal sub deposits, um, there's a recruitment of microglia from the inner retina down to the outer retina to, in order to try in an attempt to deal with this phenomenon. But there's a subclass of these microglia that um, are delineated through galactin 3 and TREM2 expression, which appear to be loitering around these deposits and helping protect the eye, or help protect the, the photoreceptors or the RPE cells uh, from these, uh, these lesions that came out. So perhaps unsurprisingly then, um, there's a big interest in targeting complement as a therapeutic modality for treating AMD. And there's a whole range of clinical assets at various different stages and preclinical assets for that matter, um, all utilizing different delivery uh, modalities being tested. But we do have some success in this field. For example, the first ever molecular intervention 
geographic atrophy came from two complement inhibitors FDA approved last year. You've got Sovorvde, which targets the C3 and the amplification loop, and Isove, which targets C5. These are both delivered by regular intervitual um, uh, injections every month or every other month, but they do have very modest uh, effect at slowing geographic atrophy lesion progression, and there's no real benefit in terms of visual acuity. So although there's a great deal of excitement that this is the beginning of some big things, uh, there's some subdued um, enthusiasm for these particular drugs only because of the, the rather modest efficacy that we see. There are also some subtle problems. For example, there's about a 10% conversion to CNV with both of these drugs. And I've heard a number of uh, hypotheses being floated for this, but very few people are talking about their pegylated formulation because we know both of these drugs are pegylated and we know that the injection of PEG into animal eyes causes uh, choroidal neovascularization. It was in fact a patented method for inducing CNV in animals as a, an animal model for wet AMD. We also know that pegylated drugs, although not in the eye necessarily, but certainly in other indications have been associated with incidence of vasculitis. And last year, once um, St. Volvide had been approved, we got real life data in from the clinic. We noted that there were some very rare cases of vasculitis um, occurring in, in patients. But there are now a whole wave of next generation complement inhibitors making their way through clinical trials. And I've listed some here um, in, in, in the middle of the, the slide. Um, these are all different inhibitors in various different stages of clinical uh, testing, but there are plenty more than this actually in preclinical development. The two that are underlined are the two FDA approved drugs. Rather tellingly, absolutely none of these are pegylated. So that gives you perhaps a bit of a, a thought or an insight into the thought processes of people behind the scenes in this particular field. And these drugs use a range of delivery approaches uh, being used from subcutaneous injections of siRNA to intravitreal or sub um, superchoroidal delivery of gene therapies to oral therapies and, and so on and so forth. But one thing is definitely clear. If you are targeting complement overactivation in AMD, you better um, deliver your drug or design your drug in such a way such that it is able to reach uh, beyond the outer blood retinal barrier uh, into the intercapillary septum and extracellular matrix surrounding that chorea capillaris. Because if your drug is retained purely within the eye, you're only ever going to be dealing with a fraction of or a small percentage of complement overactivation associated with the disease. And that may well contribute to an efficacy ceiling that we see with our previous therapeutics. So perhaps then uh, to draw to a conclusion, Complement is a very powerful player in mediating immune homeostasis around the body and is more often associated with making diseases worse rather than causing disease, but uh, with a couple of notable uh, exceptions, uh, possibly AMD being, being one of them. Complement regulation um, is a delicate balance between allowing complement turnover um, and the removal of unwanted immune complexes through opsonization, but without overactivation and causing unwanted tissue damage. Complement turnover recruits immune cells, activates them, and induces ECM remodeling, inflammation, and destruction by phagocytosis, all aspects commonly associated with diseases such as AMD. And there's been a huge surge in complement targeting therapeutic strategies, um, arguably driven by association with AMD. I mean, before AMD, we only had a couple of complement inhibitors, eculizumab, lampulizumab, for other diseases. But there's been a massive surge since the association of complement turnover with a common disease like AMD. And they're now being deployed in a range of other diseases beyond the eye. So exciting times ahead. So I hope 
that this tutorial has helped you understand a little bit more about complement turnover and regulation uh, and its involvement in disease and perhaps allows you to understand a bit more why there's so much enthusiasm in the therapeutic space. Thank you very much for your time, for listening, and thank you very much once again to the Stephen J. Ryan Initiative for Macular Research.